See how I substituted 50 for 49, which made this thing smaller, okay? What I'm gonna do is substitute two to the K for something that I know is smaller than that, namely K squared, okay? You see, two to the K is bigger than K squared. This guy's smaller. When I put it in place here, let's actually write this in, two lots of K squared minus K plus one, all squared. The reason this is advantageous to me is that I can say, oh, uh, this k squared is smaller than this, so you're ending up this whole line is something smaller. So instead of the left-hand side being equals, should write that, the left-hand side is not equal to this, it's bigger. Do you see that? This is really different, right? We're changing an equation into an inequality, and the reason we can do that is because we've made this assumption, in fact, we need to say that as well, by Assumption. We can make this statement because I've now, by according to the assumption, made substituted something bigger for something smaller. So now I've got a smaller result. That's why this is the smaller tip of things. Okay. Now, why might this be useful? Two reasons. Number one, I've used the assumption. We knew we were going to have to use it at some stage. Uh, but number two, see over here, I'm no longer trying to mix together an exponential two to the k with a polynomial, right? I've got polynomials and polynomials. I've got squares. This is much easier to deal with. So now I'm going to take Chloe's suggestion before and I'm going to expand this guy. This is going to be something that I can now collect like terms with, okay? So let's have a look. I've got 2k squared. That minus affects everything that I'm about to write. So therefore I'm going to get k squared minus 2k minus 1. How's that look? Are you happy with that? Now I can collect like terms. It's just the first pair of terms there, 2k squared minus k squared is that. All right, now at this point, um, again, you're wondering, well, where, where am I supposed to go with this? Now, I'm going to do something in a second that I know will look kind of like, how on earth did he think to do that, okay? The short answer to that question is I've had enough practice with these that I realize this is a useful thing, but by the end of this, we're gonna come back to this line, and I'm gonna try and help you uh, work out why was this a useful thing that I'm about to do. I am going to write this next line, as, instead of writing minus one, I'm gonna write that minus one as plus one minus two. Plus one minus two. Now, I, I know this is weird. You're like, why are you making things more complicated, okay? We had like terms collected. Why are you uncollecting them, okay? And the reason why is because uh, when you think about proving that something is greater than zero, things that you're looking for are things like uh, exponentials, right? That thing is bigger than zero, no matter what value of k you put in it. And also squares, right? When you've got something squared, these things tend to be positive, okay? So when I look at this guy here, I can factorize this, can't I? This guy is gonna be k minus one, all squared, okay? Now, this is useful to me because now I can actually say, see this left-hand side, if it's bigger than this, if I can make a statement about this, if I can prove that this thing is positive, then I'm good to go. Now, remember I highlighted before, see this guy, the guy we, we skip over so quickly, this attribute or this characteristic of K is very important. I'm going to use it right now, okay? And I'm gonna highlight it by putting it in a separate color for you, okay? Since I know that K is not just any number, K has to be greater than four, I can say, since k is greater than 4, I can make some statements about this that will be related to this. For example, um, I don't have a k just by itself. I've actually got k minus 1 in there. You see that? So if I subtract 1 from both sides, I'm getting 3. Can you agree with that? Now, I actually don't just have k minus 1 by itself. It's been squared. Now, watch out. I'm going to write this next line, and then I want us to think about it together. I've just squared both sides. But... We just talked before about the fact that you can't just square both sides in inequality, except for when you can, right? Think about this, right? I gave you a particular example that broke this, where you couldn't square both sides. What was it about that example that made it problematic? The answer is the negative, right? Um, sometimes you can square both sides. For instance, three is less than four. That was something we said earlier, right? If I square both sides, nine, 16, is the inequality still true? And the answer is yes, okay? It's the negative that caused the problem. Now have a look here, right? When you square this right-hand side, you're multiplying by three. Is that okay? It is, right? It's a positive number. What about over here? 
when you multiply by k minus one again, am I allowed to do that? And the answer is, yes I can. Because look, k minus one is greater than three, it has to be positive, right? So this guy's positive, this guy's positive, I can satisfactorily square, okay? Now, I'm almost there. I don't just have k minus one squared all by itself, I have k minus one squared minus two. So I'm just gonna subtract uh, two from both sides. That gives me a seven on the right hand side. But now look at this thing, right? See this, it's some number, it's greater than seven. If I ask you all to think of a number that's greater than seven, I can say with confidence that all of the numbers you just thought of, they all have to be bigger than zero, right? If they were bigger than seven, they have to be bigger than zero. They have to be positive. Now, do you see what we've just established? This guy here is here, and I've just shown, hey, uh, that guy there is greater than zero, right? Like that's what we just established. Now if this is bigger than this, and this is bigger than this, it's like a big fish eating a smaller fish which eats an even smaller fish, this guy clearly is bigger than that one down the end. So I can say, oh, the left hand side must be greater than zero itself. What is the left hand side? It's this, right? So two to the k plus one minus, what do we have? k plus one all squared. Just to make this nice and neat and be complete, I'm going to write it in the form that I originally put it when I had uh, the k plus one statement right there. So this is it. It's true, I can write this, therefore it's true for n equals k plus one. Take a deep breath and you can say at last I've proven this, this, uh, true by the principle of mathematical induction. So. I know a lot of this feels quite weird and unusual because it's the first time you've seen a proof, uh, an induction proof dealing with these kinds of objects, right? Can we rewind for a second? I told you before that this step uh, in here would look a bit weird, like why would I do that? And the answer was, now that you've seen where I went, I was essentially doing something you haven't touched for a while, you thought about it maybe in the context of quadratics. I was completing this square do you see that? That's what I did. Um, here's this term, I halved it and then I squared it, which gave me one, but then I, I didn't really want to change from line to line if I don't have to. It, it hurts my brain when I do that, I swap a number for something else just because I can, because it's an inequality. So to preserve everything here, plus one take away two is the same as take away one. So once I've got that, I've got something easy to work with, okay? Now, uh, you can prove this uh, by uh, not method two, which is making everything greater than zero and then going with that. You can prove this by starting from this statement, but we'll have a look a little bit later on at how you do that.